The United States is one of the most militarily successful nations in all of history. Emblematic of this is its decisive intervention during World War II, without which Allied victory simply would not have been possible, or in the Revolutionary War, through which it freed itself from colonial bondage and set itself on a path to becoming the superpower that it is today. But despite this formidable record, it also has plenty of military failures and disasters, and today we're going to look at some of the worst ones. For our first military failure, we must cast our minds back to the 19th century, where in the tumultuous expanses of the American West, a small band of natives were preparing to give Uncle Sam a bloody nose in a conflict that became known as Red Cloud's War. Red Cloud, the leader of the Oglala Lakota subtribe, was both a fearsome warrior and also a brilliant strategist, an indigenous leader whose vision penetrated the veiled arrogance and tactical shortcomings of the American military establishment. His war waged against the encroachment of his people's sacred territories between 1860 and 1868 saw Red Cloud leverage his intimate understanding of the expansive rugged terrain and forge a coalition between various tribes, providing a strong and united front that the soldiers of the U.S. Army simply couldn't match. Red Cloud's point of umbrage was the establishment of the Bozeman Trail and the many forts surrounding it from 1863. These had been erected to safeguard the passage of miners en route to the goldfields of Montana, but were built with a stark disregard for established treaties and the sacred significance of the indigenous land that it perforated. So, Red Cloud's goal proved to be a simple one. Fight a guerrilla war against these installations until they were vanquished from his lands. He proved very adept at implementing this strategy too. The American military, rendered ignorant by the spirit of Manifest Destiny, systematically underestimated his resistance, perceiving his coalition of indigenous tribes not as formidable adversaries, but as mere obstacles in the path toward unabated expansion. The forts, envisioned as bastions of security and symbols of American prowess, instead became isolated strongholds vulnerable to the adept guerrilla warfare tactics employed by Red Cloud and his warriors. A specific example of his guerrilla prowess comes from December of 1866, when, near Fort Phil Kearney, Red Cloud and a thousand of his best warriors ambushed a detachment of 81 soldiers led by Captain William Fetterman. They never saw the enormous force coming, and before they knew what had hit them, all 81 of them lay dead, only managing to mount a token defense that took no more than 60 of the natives to the grave. The skirmish in time became known as the Fetterman Fight, and was a devastating defeat that rocked the U.S. Army to its core. Not merely a physical defeat, but a psychological one, and one that dismantled the myth of invincibility that had enveloped the American military persona. Fetterman's tactical errors were palpably evident, yet there existed a deeper, more insidious failure rooted in cultural ignorance and a stark underestimation of indigenous leadership, military capability, and resolve. The U.S., in its pursuit of territorial expansion, neglected to comprehend the socio-political and cultural complexities of the indigenous tribe. The notion that the natives might be able to mount an effective resistance simply was not considered before that point. Thanks to Red Cloud, however, the US Army was forced not only to consider, but accept that very point. And so in 1868, the Treaty of Fort Laramie was signed, a reluctant but inevitable concession that saw the US abandon all of its forts along the Bozeman Trail and withdraw its troops. Red Cloud had not merely defended his people's territories, but had strategically exposed the vulnerabilities and failures of the American military apparatus. Red Cloud's war presents a narrative that extends beyond battles and treaties, seeping into the domains of strategic integrity, cultural understanding and the acknowledgement of indigenous sovereignty and military capacity. The United States, in its quest for expansion, collided with a resistance that was both physical and philosophical, dismantling preconceived notions of indigenous inferiority and military incapability. And well, speaking of dismantling preconceived notions, let's now dive into another failure that is all the more controversial. When it comes to controversial American wars, they don't get much more controversial than the War of 1812 between the US and the UK. Ask a hundred historians who won it and you'll get, somehow, a hundred different answers. For American historians, the war is often remembered for the resilience of the fledgling nation and the stirring national anthem born from the bombardment of Fort McHenry. However, a meticulous peeling back of the layers uncovers a reality less spoken about. The United States did not attain its primary objectives, thus presenting a plausible argument that this conflict was, in fact, a US military failure. But to explain this argument, first we got to be clear about what those primary objectives actually were, and for the Americans, what they wanted was simple. The end of British military presence in North America and the annexation of Canada. American strategists and politicians, basking in the triumphant glow of the recent American Revolution, envisioned Canadians welcoming their troops as liberators. But 
A rather harsh reality awaited instead. A significant number of Canadians were loyalists, exiled from the nascent United States due to their allegiance to the British Crown during the Revolution. These Canadians, far from welcoming the American forces, aligned firmly with the British military and stymied the American campaign to conquer and annex Canada. Moreover, American planners overestimated their own unity. Disparate interests among states, particularly the New England states, which maintained strong maritime trading ties with Britain and outright opposed the war, weakens the American front both politically and militarily. For a time, in an unsettling display of disunity, these states even considered secession and reunification with Britain significantly undermining the war effort. As a result of these poor estimations, the U.S. suffered numerous defeats, with notable battles being the Battle of Queenston Heights in 1812 and the Battle of Chrysler's Farm a year later, both of which saw invasions of Canada totally thwarted. But the worst defeat, by far, was the Battle of Bladensburg in 1814, after which the British entered the capital unopposed and raised many government buildings in what became known as the Burning of Washington. To make matters worse for the Americans, that same year Napoleon was defeated and subsequently imprisoned on Elba, meaning that the British now had a lot of spare troops in Europe that they could commit to America. With total defeat imminent, the Americans sat down for peace talks in August 1814 and signed the Treaty of Ghent soon after, a de facto peace in which neither the US nor the UK lost or gained any territory. It is hard not to view this as a failure for the US when measured against their ambitions at the onset of the war. They unequivocally fell short of these. Their primary objective of annexing Canada and evicting the British from North America remains unfulfilled. Frankly, they were also lucky that the British were not eager to overly exploit the peace negotiations because between their less than stellar performance in the war and the full might of the recently freed up British military which stood posed to leap across the Atlantic, they wouldn't have been in much of a position to quibble had the British wanted more from the treaty. Couple this with the domestic strife and lack of cohesion that the war exposed, and the War of 1812 is not just a mere failure, but it's a testament to the perils of overreaching ambition without proper preparation and unity. The Vietnam War, which lasted from 1955 to 1975, involved the commitment of over 2.7 million American troops, the ultimate sacrifice of approximately 58,000 of them, and the wounding of over 150,000 more. The US's primary objective, ostensibly clear, was to defend capitalist South Vietnam against the expansive reach of the Communist North. It completely failed to do this. But the failure was not just a military defeat, no. Rather, it was the consequence of geopolitical machinations, socio-political upheavals, and a burden burgeoning anti-war sentiment at home, which all worked in tandem to render the American military machine impotent and ultimately handed South Vietnam over to the communists. Now, it all began going wrong in late 1972, with the US Air Force exercising its bombing prowess over key industrial and military targets in Hanoi and Hai Phong. With this, there was a palpable sense that the strategic tide had turned in the US's favor. The North Vietnamese, with little other option, then entered the Paris Peace Talks, and by January 1973, the Paris Peace Accords were signed and a US withdrawal from Vietnam began. VV Day, symbolizing victory in Vietnam, resonated within the corridors of the White House. Notably, however, these accords did not end the war. Rather, with the military situation now largely tied up, South Vietnam was going to be left to handle the mop-up itself. As part of this, a crucial pledge was made. The US would replenish South Vietnam's military hardware in the face of future North Vietnamese aggression. This commitment was not merely a logistical assurance, but an essential cornerstone upon which the entire strategy for preserving a capitalist South Vietnam rested. However, the domestic political landscape within the US was undergoing a seismic shift. The Watergate scandal had just broken, because of which President Nixon resigned in 1974, and with the scandal blighting the Republican Party, the consequent November congressional elections ushered in a Democratic majority in Congress, many of whom were vehemently opposed to further involvement or aid to South Vietnam. Consequently, a crucial lifeline was severed as the 94th Congress withdrew military support, leaving South Vietnam in a precarious position. President Ford, acutely aware of the ominous horizon unfolding before South Vietnam, implored Congress in April 1975 to uphold the promises made. But his pleading fell on largely deaf ears, as even during his poignant speech, members of Congress exited the chamber, symbolizing a definitive turning point away from a commitment that had been solemnly made. The defunding of military aid to South Vietnam was not merely a withdrawal of support, it was the crux upon which the fate of the nation pivoted, and into the vacuum that was created, the forces of North Vietnam advanced unimpeded. South Vietnam, bereft of the anticipated support and facing a robust and determined adversary, capitulated. Saigon fell on the 30th of April 1975, and with its fall, the entirety of Vietnam was enveloped under communist control. The objective to maintain a capital of South Vietnam was a failure. With this, the US had achieved a rather remarkable feat, snatching defeat 
from the jaws of victory. Surprisingly, this perspective is actually a controversial one, with many historians, notably American historians, arguing that the political defeat should be viewed isolated from the military victory. But we aren't about that. From our perspective, the US went into Vietnam to keep the South capitalist, and it failed to do so. And that basic fact is all that matters when we make this assessment. The US intervention in Afghanistan, initiated in 2001, is undoubtedly oh, one of its greatest military failures. The 9-11 terrorist attacks, which left almost 3,000 Americans dead, acted as the catalyst, thrusting the US into a war on the rugged terrains of Afghanistan with the primary objective of dismantling the Taliban regime, which was believed to be harboring and supporting al-Qaeda terrorists, including the mastermind of the attacks, Osama bin Laden. Commencing with Operation Enduring Freedom, US forces, backed by a coalition of allies, swiftly overran the Taliban. Kabul the nation's capital was captured in November of 2001, a mere two months after the war began. This quick success gave rise to optimism. The Taliban seemed defeated, and Afghanistan appeared to be on the cusp of a brighter, democratic future. As the years rolled on, the US became embroiled in nation-building, attempting to reconstruct a war-torn nation with democratic institutions, infrastructure, and the promotion of rights, especially for women and minority groups. However, beneath this seemingly promising veneer lay a multitude of problems. Afghanistan's complex tribal politics, the influence of regional powers, rampant corruption, and the resilience of Taliban fighters all combined to challenge American objectives. The US military, one of the most advanced and sophisticated in the world, found itself battling an elusive enemy that utilized guerrilla tactics, melting away into the vast challenging terrain, only to strike back with deadly force. Over the two-decade conflict, the US committed thousands of troops and invested billions of dollars into the Afghan security forces and infrastructure. While there were periods when it seemed like progress was tangible, the establishment of schools, the return of women to public life, elections, and even peace dialogues, underlying issues persisted. The Afghan government, though officially in power, struggled with legitimacy issues and internal rifts, often proving ineffectual outside of urban centers. Perhaps more problematic was the Afghan security forces' perennial state of unpreparedness. Despite rigorous training and vast resources poured into its establishment, when put to the test, the Afghan military often displayed a lack of morale, cohesion, and capability, marking the eventual U.S. exit after a precarious affair. That exit came after nearly 20 years. Years. The US, in a bid to end its forever war, negotiated with the Taliban and set a timeline for withdrawal, finally pulling out its last troops in August of 2021. This decision, to many analysts, seemed hasty and ill-prepared. As US troops began to leave, the Taliban rapidly advanced, capturing territory at an alarming rate. The culmination of this swift offensive was the fall of Kabul in August 2021, almost mirroring the rapidity with which the city was taken two decades earlier. The Afghan government collapsed, and President Ashraf Ghani fled the country. The very force the US had set out to defeat was now back in control. The Afghanistan war was a failure. The Iraq War, which spanned from 2003 to 2011, remains a contentious chapter in American history. At the heart of the debate lies the very rationale for the invasion, a topic veiled in layers of political rhetoric, intelligence reports, and international tensions. Over time, various justifications for the war were provided, with some appearing contradictory and inconsistent. Yet among the myriad of reasons given, one stood out as the most prominent. Iraq's supposed possession of weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, that posed an imminent threat to the US and its allies. From early on, the narrative of WMDs was persistent. Leaders of the Western world, anchored by the US, painted a vivid picture of a rogue state under the leadership of Saddam Hussein amassing dangerous weapons capable of wreaking havoc beyond Iraq's borders. But what? really underpinned this narrative. The intelligence community's conclusions, while debated internally, generally supported the idea that Hussein was either in possession of such weapons or he was actively pursuing them. However, as the invasion proceeded and the subsequent occupation lengthened, this foundational justification began to show cracks. Despite extensive searches and investigations, the US military was unable to uncover any active WMD programs or stockpiles. All of Iraq's chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons programs have been shuttered as per international agreements following the Gulf War. One could argue, however, that the absence of WMDs doesn't render the Iraq War a failure. After all, with or without them, the trigger-happy Saddam was a potential threat to US geopolitical interests in the region, as his invasions of Iran and Kuwait in 1980 and 1990 respectively demonstrate. Where the point becomes harder to argue is when one considers that the bungled nature of US withdrawal led to the rise of a threat far greater than Saddam. 
ISIS. Originating as a faction of Al-Qaeda, the group adeptly capitalized on the socio-political chaos and sectarian fissures left in the wake of the American exit in 2011, launching a campaign of conquest that spread across the whole region. By 2014, they formally declared a caliphate across their extensive territories in Iraq and Syria and unleashed a wave of barbarism that the region has not seen since the medieval age. This development underscored a poignant irony. An intervention initially justified as a preemptive strike against a potential threat had inadvertently birthed a fully realized and hostile threat. Soon enough, this threat spread to U.S. soil, and as of the time of recording, there have been seven known ISIS attacks in the U.S., the worst of which, the Orlando nightclub shooting of the 12th of June 2016, left 49 innocent people dead and a further 53 injured. All in all, ISIS attacks on U.S. soil have killed 72 and left 108 injured. Such attacks haven't been limited to just the U.S. either, with its allies also having been targeted to the U.K. having seen 37 people killed and 189 injured in the five known attacks on the country's soil. All in all, over 30 countries, US aligned or otherwise, have had to suffer such attacks all of them a direct repercussion of the bungled U.S. war in Iraq. And those WMDs Saddam didn't have that the U.S. went to war to try and prevent being used? Well, it turns out ISIS not only had WMDs, but also used them. According to a report released by IHS Conflict Monitor, a London-based intelligence collective and analysis service in 2016, ISIS used chemical weapons on at least 52 occasions since their ascension to statehood in 2014. Given the fact that the war was started in part to prevent the proliferation and use of WMDs, this hardly speaks to it being successful, does it? This perspective is a controversial one, as there are many eager to argue that the war in Iraq was a success, and while we certainly welcome debate, we feel quite confident that, in light of the perspective that we just outlined, the war in Iraq has earned its place on this list of US military failures.